Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Bernie Counselor Ted Shoesmith. Bernie is where small town charm meets adventure in the heart of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Bernie is a historic mountain town founded in 1898, located in the southeast British Columbia, and is completely surrounded by the Canadian Rockies. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Bernie Counselor Ted Shoesmith. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Counselor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking the overarching question I've asked every single counselor, Mayor Warden Reeve, who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Ted? Oh, that's a big answer. There's a lot of things. Um, it's kind of uh, sort of instilled in me and my family from a pretty early age to, you know, step up and be involved in stuff. Uh, couple that with just a general sense of annoyance at the city on my part. Um, and I, I've been with the Lions for a very long time, uh, almost my whole life. And their, their motto is actually, we serve. And uh, I thought about it, you know, it, <clears throat> my life kind of in order so that's good step one step out is my family in order that's that's okay and and you know you climb up that ladder and then I get to well the local town isn't that great so I should step up and help there because you know the other layers down are okay so what was it about the political draw that drew you into municipal politics was mom and dad political or did you get the political bug by yourself in other contexts uh, no, mom and dad weren't really political. Um, I just kind of thought about, um, you know, if I'm going to sit there and complain about something that doesn't, that doesn't really land, I should maybe try and, and get involved and, and see, you know, it, do I really have any input that's of value here? Like, can I actually help? And, and I figured, you know, I, I know enough about the town. I've been here my whole life and I, I know enough people and enough of what's going on that I think. Yeah, I, I I could weigh in and, and maybe that might have some value. Okay, so you're a unique entity then for this show, because usually whenever I speak to people who get involved municipally, I often hear the same thing of, I didn't really know what was going on at City Hall. I didn't really know what was going on in my community. I was involved in community groups, but truly the day-to-day -day operations of the city, I didn't really understand. For you, it sounds like you knew what the sort of the heartbeat of your of uh, for Ernie was growing up a little bit yeah i mean part of it stems from um background and and my my, my job i mean i've i've worked uh in the trades and for a family for a long time and then I had a falling out with my dad but i'm still in the trades working around here and we're good i'm not me and my dad get along great but i just don't work for him anymore um but just seeing how I feel like that's another podcast in itself there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could write a short book about that probably, but uh, no, just seeing how, how difficult it could be to deal with the city um, from, you know, all the varying people that, that hire me. I'm kind of the, the fly on the wall in a lot of the, the rooms that these people are in when they're trying to steer a project through or what have you. Um, so I kind of ran, um, hoping that I could improve that a bit, but also because I, I could see that the uh, the infrastructure is is uh, coming to a, a, a bad way here. And uh, I think that our, our renewed focus on that was kind of needed. So I, I, I say all the time in council, you know, we got to fix the pipes. And by that, I mean, like, right from the top all the way down to the bottom, 
all of them, the whole thing. Um, and I was concerned get... that. Go ahead. Oh no! Uh, yeah, I was concerned that we were just kind of letting it slide, and and in some cases, literally. Um, but you know, there's there's a there's a set of information and knowledge you have as a as a citizen who cares, and then you get in the room and you actually read the reports and and you see stuff, and you know, it's not a ship of fools sailing off a cliff, but you know, it's uh, definitely you learn a lot more once you're sitting in the councilman's chair. Do you get a sense that there's <laughs> So it's a question along the lines of what you've just said. And I don't know how to properly word it. So it doesn't make it sound like I'm being disrespectful to anyone, but I'm not. So please preface I, that. Before I'm you, a I tradesman. You won't okay. defend me. Okay. Understandable that now that you're around that council table, you get a lot more information than the average resident probably gets on a day-to-day -day basis of what's going on in the community those infrastructure projects, what needs to be upgraded, what needs to be uh, replaced, what needs to be repaired, what can go on a little bit longer and then repair it two, three years from now. Do you get a sense that people are aware of what actually is going on in your community? Or do you get a sense that there's an apathetic nature? As long as the water turns on, I don't care what's going on at city hall and if you have to replace 12th street um, line or fifth street line i don't care just fix it whenever you have to and don't raise my taxes too much <laughs> <laughs> that's you know that's a good question and and i don't feel disrespected by that at all so but there might job. be someone um, who watches that because i guarantee you i will get emails about something of this episode because i always do Oh, yeah, just truck. I mean, you know what? Uh, no, the town is, I mean, there's always a, uh, anytime you measure people, there's like a bell curve distribution and you've got people on one end who know a lot um, and they're pretty informed and then they spread that around. Most people know a bit and don't really care. If you tell them they care and they shrug and they go, yeah, that makes sense. And then you have a bunch of people that just don't know or you know, and usually they don't care either, but sometimes they really care, but they also don't know. That's the hardest group of people to deal with. What um, do you mean? Oh, just people who have no idea what's going on, but really, really are very loud. Uh, There's always the some in every local group, minority, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, no, on the whole, I would say people are kind of aware that we have some issues as to how serious some of those are. I don't think the average guy really understands, but I think they do know we need to put some work into it. And I mean, we are, the city is working on it. It's, it's a big ship. These things move slow and it's, it's, uh, you, you know what? I'd be concerned if the city moved really quickly. I actually would be. I think we'd all be really surprised as well if, for someone who speaks to municipal <laughs> leaders. The pace of municipalities is not off, often the quickest. Um, the role of a councillor is pretty daunting because you, at the end of the day, are one vote on your council that has to make the decision of the implications of your community. That means you have to decide on service levels. That's what That way you have to decide on tax increases. How do you make the decisions, because you are that one vote, in the best interest of your community while understanding that you could impact people negatively with the decisions you make around that council table? Well, that's a really great question. I like the, especially about the neg negative effect thing. There's nothing you can do as a government body that doesn't hurt somebody somewhere. And if you think you haven't, well, you just spent somebody else's money. So like, even if you have a smashing success, you've taken something from somebody to do it. Um, so as to how I make those decisions, uh, in short, really carefully. Um, and, you know, I haven't always made all the best decisions. The, uh, that's It's a tough job. It's, it's really tough. Um, you know, in my day job, like if I build a wall and it's wrong, everybody looks at it and they go, that's wrong. And everybody agrees it's wrong. If I build a wall and it's right, everybody agrees. That's that's great. And so you, you can. Or they don't even pretty... notice the fact that you built the wall. Sometimes, sometimes if I'm really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but municipal politics is different because you do something and there's guaranteed to be some people that are mad, some people that are happy. It doesn't matter what you do, but also it's so subjective. And, and you could 
go on screwing up as as a city hall for a long time without ever really realizing it because it's subjective and you're removed from it, right? Um, so when I make a decision, I try really hard to actually look at what it is we're doing and and measure the impacts to the people who are closest to it. Um, and when I prioritize things, I, I kind of take Maslow's hierarchy of needs into account. Like, you know, you, you start with the most urgent things needed for survival. And then once you're there, you know, you work on your self-actualization and your, you know, your walking paths and libraries and these things. And, uh, but you have to make sure that the water and, and sewage works first, of course. Um, yeah, I hope that's a good answer. I don't really feel like no. I... No, answered I, I, you, exactly you what did, you asked, but but I'm gonna piggyback on that a little bit because how important is it for yourself? Because you have to make the tough choices. How important is it for yourself to reach out to everyone, even those people that you think are going to be upset with your decision or be in favor of your decision? Because you are elected by the everyone, not just the people who voted for you, but people you represent the people who voted for you and the people who didn't vote for you. And that means that you have to get outside your silo and talk to people who may disagree with you on some of the issues you vote for. So for you, how important is it as a counselor when making those tough decisions to hear all sides of the stories and not just the one side that is sort of the social media echo chamber that we find ourselves in in 2024? Well, that's that's another really good question. Um, that's super important. Um, and in a local context, I mean, I kind of view Fernie there's several different Fernies and, and a lot of people, if you find yourself in one of these cliques or, or groups or what have you, you might be completely unaware of, or just dislike another one of the groups. Um, you know, you've got old Fernie and you've got coal miners, you've got uh, papered on top of that. You've got a uh, tourism sector. Like it's a great town. It has it all. But a lot of times these different groups don't uh, mingle as much as I think they could. Um, and so it is actually important to get the take from different people. And yeah, I mean, I've often found I mean, the people who disagree with me the most who would show up and, and maybe yell at a local politician or something like that. Kind of what I've found with those people is you listen to them for a bit. They get tired of yelling or they, they say their piece and then you talk to them. And sometimes they're right, actually. Um, and you usually learn something. Um, although sometimes you just waste your time and you feel bad, but, um, it's something, you know, it's something I, I feel I have to do whenever there is one of these things, I, I tend to go right at it rather than avoid it. I'd, I'd rather stand on the street and talk to people who are upset than, than, you know, do, do this one and, 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 you know, draw my blinds. I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't. Okay. So municipalities have a role to play in the day-to-day -day lives of people. They have a jurisdictional role to play in the governance structure, in the hierarchy, if you will call that. But residents don't care about that hierarchy. When they approach you, because they probably know you better than they know their MLA or their MP, they'll probably bring up issues that are not in your jurisdiction, whether that be provincial education, whether it be healthcare, whether it be, which I just had a conversation with a mayor in uh, BC today, the war in Israel, in Gaza. How often are you finding yourself talking about issues with your residents that are not traditionally in the provincial jurisdiction? And then on the sort of follow-up question to that is, how do you tell people it's not your jurisdiction without telling them, go talk to your MLA? Because they've come talk to you for a reason. Good question. Um, Yeah, so... You know, most you, people are. Do you even get um, that? Oh, I do. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, uh, hyper local issues. Uh, we we have some huge healthcare issues, and you know, we're really we get the short end of a the stick there. And it is a provincial issue. It's an interprovincial issue. I mean, we used to be able to get care from Calgary, which is a, as you know, just a nice jaunt. Um, now a lot of times our care comes from like Vancouver, Kelowna. And people are like, hey, you know, what can we do? Like, this is bad. And it's like, well, that's that's a provincial thing. Although I go to UBCM or FCM and I, I bother people about it. That's that's the best I can do is, you know, bother Ministry of Municipalities or bother the Ministry of Health. Um, you know, 
write it, write an angry letter or something like that. But that's not a thing that the municipality can handle. Um, you know, on, uh, another one where that's the case is we've got this new zoning uh, rules coming down from the province. That's a provincial set of rules that we don't have a choice whether or not we're abiding by. And so when someone's upset about that, I, ex I, I just simply explain to them, listen, you know, if we were to stand in this way, in the way of this, we would just get bulldozed aside and it would happen anyway. That's, and that's just how it is. Um, I, I see those, those discussions as an opportunity kind of to just educate people on like the role of local, provincial and federal government, which until I sat in this chair, I wasn't fully aware of either. Uh, that was a whole really? new set of things I learned. Honesty. I, I love it in a politician. Never, you don't get honesty on these shows that often, but thank you for telling me that. Um, I'm probably going to be a one termer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't vote in Fernie. I do not. I've been to Fernie once. I could not say that, but you're on my show. So I support you for whatever your future endeavors are. <laughs> well, thanks, I want to turn to Fernie as a whole. And before I do that, I want to preface this line of questions because I think this is where the big conversation is about to happen. This conversation is a conversation between myself and the counselor. This is not a motion of counsel, not a direction of counsel, not even a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion and his opinion alone. It may match up with what counsel's talking about. It may not. But please remember, it's his opinion and his opinion alone. Counselor, with that being said, and knowing that I will get at least one email because that's what I tend to get, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the town of Fernie today as of recording? Success. We're a victim of our success. We, we are an awesome and excellent place. And the issue with that comes down to we're a town this big and we've garnered a worldwide reputation um, and this many people want to come here and it's led to some unprecedented growth. Um, it's led to an awesome lifestyle and an awesome place to be, but it's also taxed every resource you can think of that the city provides um, or has anything to do with. We've got, uh, land, um, housing, um, there's a load on our system. I mean, our sewage system, it, it runs so close to capacity. It's scary sometimes because of just the bulk of people here and some other reasons. I mean, there's, there's storm inflows and stuff like that, that we can work on fixing, but that's the biggest issue facing Fernie is that we're a town of 6,240 that used to be a town of under 5,000 that is a desirable place for several hundred thousand people. And so in a lot of cases, the locals are feeling, and, and I would say they are, they're just displaced because it's kind of in order to stay here and compete and be able for your children to have a house, um, you, you need a six figure income. You have to have one to, to, to get a house here. Um, and downstream of that, uh, you know, like I went to school, my grad class was a uh, roughly 110 people or so. I can count the number of us still here on one hand, and it's all through either their parents helped them or, or in the case of this house, I bought a derelict dump for nothing and was able to fix it because of my my uh, work. Um, but that's not everybody. Not everybody can do that. So there's a few different problems that spin off from that. But if you look at all, at the all the problems Fernie has relates to the fact that we've been so successful and I'm not arguing against being a successful town. It's just stating that this is how it is. We, we have to provide these services to maintain this level of growth and to try and keep different rungs on the property ladder. The market has an unlimited insatiable demand for McMansions and for ski lodges there also needs to be rungs on the property ladder for young families and for employees that, that aren't just traps. Um, and that's a tough one. That's a really tough problem. And I, I honestly don't think, I mean, it doesn't matter how much we build, the demand will still outstrip what we're building, at least for now. 
do you get a sense that people want to see Fernie grow though? Because you talked about you talked about earlier on about the different fractions. And I say fractions because I'm trying to be a little bit nice. And because there's the old <laughs> Fernie, there's the new Fernie, and then there's the people who want to move to Fernie. Do you get a sense that the people I don't want to say nimbyism because I hate the word, but I have to in this sense. Do you get a sense that they don't want to see Fernie grow and live up to its more potential that it could potentially be when you add more housing, add more infrastructure projects, add more diverse housing stocks so that way new families can move in or retirees can downsize into a smaller location. Well, sure. And we see that. And, and, you know, the retirees downsizing, that's a hard thing. There's a lot of old people from here that, man, they can't stay. And, and that's, that's really rough when, when you've got the roots and, and, and you can't. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of old Fernie and, and I've seen this with, you know, some of the zoning things we've done or approving variances and this and that to allow people to sublet stuff like that. People are like, well, why can't it just stay the same? And, the truth of that is that, well, it could, but then what would happen is the demand would just like absolutely make your property values insane. And when your kid goes to inherit your house or buy it, they can't. And and it, it would just turn us into, I mean, nobody who worked would be able to afford to be here. It'd be a collection of rich second houses. So, I mean... And it's interesting. I mean, I'm I'm in the longtime Fernie contingent. I was born and raised here. I was, and you know, I have never left. I mean, I went to Hosmer once, but um, we met down it's there. Tough. You left Fernie, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually lived in Hosmer for a few years. There you go. Um, yeah, which a great time in my life. I love Hosmer, but uh, so do you get a sense that you have to you have to kind of be a juggler in Fernie when you're trying to deal with some of these long-term consequences of the success of yesteryear because you want to keep the community the way it is but you want to grow the community but also on the other hand you want to make it more affordable but you don't want to cause people to lose investments in their house that they built they've either invested into their house and you sort of have to play that juggling act of making sure everyone feels happy while understanding that you're not going to please 100 percent of the people yeah, for sure you won't. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, as far as it goes for me, I, I kind of see that the choice for us is to become something akin to like one of those really high-end resorts where everything's just insanely priced and they just bust the help in. Or we can permit some of the growth, take the edge off. Because th there's a saving grace with this, right? I mean, at the top end of the curve for cost, you get a really high return on any change you make because the air is actually pretty thin up there. So if we provide another hundred units or 200 units here or there, that actually makes a big difference because you're, you're dealing with so high up the, the slope there. And I kind of feel like if we provide enough of the lower rungs on the property ladder in the coming years, what was Fernie can stay and become part of what will be Fernie. And, and, you know, the, the new Fernie can, can, we can all join together. We can be one nice big Fernie and we don't have to be displaced nomads or, you know, second homers. Cause what's, what's interesting and unique about Fernie is unlike other ski towns, we have a coal mine. And so that's kept the town here. So it provides this awesome sense of community and culture. Right. And that's what makes Fernie unique actually is the civic society all the different clubs, all the different groups. I mean, I if I if I started listing them, it would take ten minutes to just describe the number of cool things that little groups of people are doing because they're putting roots down and making those connections. And, and I think that if if we grow enough that people don't have to leave, then we can remain a community without doing anything too draconian or stupid. I, I'm kind of all over the map here on this one because it's it's a yeah. hard thing to describe. I don't. You know? it, it seems like it, but you just said something I just want to make sure I, I understood correctly. Um, it seems like there's many different Fernies that it could potentially transpose itself in 2030, 2045. I'm going to ask a political question here, and you don't need to answer it if you don't want to. You need to tell me just to move on, and I certainly will. Do you get a sense that the work you're doing around the council table will set uh, Fernie up 
for the success of not 2024, but 2035, 2050. So these issues that you're talking about will be not as big as issue then. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my fellow counselors has actually said to me, all of our problems are someone else's solutions from 10 years ago. <laughs> um, yeah. and he's so very right about that. So, you know, I think 100% that's the case. I mean, we're tackling the infrastructure issue more or less head on. Um, takes a while before that's a visible thing because these things move really slowly. But I think that in that regard, we are setting the town up for success because, I mean, we're, we're going to face a bunch of infrastructure issues in the near future. And the success or failure of the town kind of hinges on that and how we deal with that. We just closed our community center uh, last week or the week before. Um, it's all a little hazy. I've been pretty busy, but it was uh, not a fun decision to be a part of. And, and what it comes down to is it was no longer a safe building to have people in. Um, and, you know, man, the cost of replacement, the cost of remediation. I mean, we had to find places for weddings and stuff. So we're already kind of behind the eight ball on that one. And we're going to have to play some catch up. So a hundred percent, what we're doing now matters for the long term, just because it's that bedrock infrastructure and service levels. I want to flip the original question around because Understandable, every municipality has its fair share of challenges. And I don't say that disrespectfully to any municipality. It's just the truth. Every municipality is struggling right now. But what the thing they don't have is the accomplishments. What's the thing when you look at Fernie as a whole, you're proud of? What's the thing when you look at Fernie as a government perspective, you're proud of? What's the accomplishment that you boast about when it comes to Fernie? Hmm. Wow. I'm not used to people asking really positive, happy, nice questions. Nobody ever comes up on the street and asks that, you know. But um, they should. They should. They should. They, they should, should they actually. Should. <laughs> and so I'll start with the most recent thing. Um, you know, we had a wedding in our community center that we kicked out, and um City Hall bent itself over backwards to provide a new venue and to make it all right. And you know, I know a lot of our staff worked pretty hard to make that happen. And I was really happy to see that they did that. That's a nice thing. I mean, that brings us all together a bit, trying to deal with this. And uh, I'm really proud of how they did that. I think uh, I think we have or we've done a really good job of getting grant money, actually. Like, it's, as City Hall, when I go to UBCM or FCM, literally every person that I talk to that could hand us money already knows who we are and has probably already given us money, which is amazing to me. And I can't take credit for any of that. I just, the, that's good. The predecessors did great. Um, I actually think that we should be proud of our uh, plowing. It's been a little embattled lately. We had a huge high staff turnover and all these things, but over a hundred kilometers of roads by a small team of guys and, uh, they hit almost nothing. They do a really good job in, in, from that standpoint. And you know what? Somebody will send you an angry email about that. Somebody will send me an angry email about that. Because there's one thing people are always mad about. It's plowing. But honest to goodness, those guys do a pretty good job. And we, sh we should actually say that more. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Not just not the fact that they do a great job, but administration goes over and above and they are fantastic and that i think a lot of people forget that our administration works tirelessly there's my little saving grace there <laughs> sorry sorry but from a from a community perspective what what are you proud about what so you talk about the administration oh, you talk we're about the best go ahead oh yeah from a community side we're the yeah. best group of people ever fernie is an extremely welcoming and exceptional town i mean you can go have a beer in Fernie and on your right, there's a laborer and on your left, there's a billionaire who invented something and everybody has a beer and we're all together and it's fine. Um, 
we've got lots of big events that bring people together from every walk of life that are just downright fun. I mean, I'm heavily involved in the demolition derby. This is our 50th coming up. It's going to be amazing. We're um, going to talk about that you know, in two seconds. So hold, sure. Yeah, hold, absolutely. Put a pin in that for two seconds. Yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, there's a lot of these things. You know, we've got an Elks club that's really active. They put on nice events. They rent their hall out. We've got uh, all kinds of uh, arts guilds and things doing like quilting and felting. And there's actually got a world-class felter. She's amazing. Um, Just up the street from me. And... Uh, you know, we used to have uh, the mine rescue competition, which was like the Olympics for uh, mine rescue. It's a big deal for the people involved. You wouldn't know about it unless you were in mining, but it was really intense. And it was it's something that, uh, you know, we should be super proud of, of hosting that, you know, we've got these world class rescue people as somebody that works in the mines quite frequently. Uh, I'm happy to know they're well trained and that they know their stuff. Um. Yeah, we've also, we just had a skidjoring this year. We just held a, uh, a night for Niku, a big charity event. We're raising money for a neonatal intensive care unit for Cranbrook. And a bunch of country stars came down and uh, just played. They they all pitched in to help us. Um, local businesses got on board. Uh, you know, local charities got on board. You know, civic-wise, we are one of the best towns ever. And when we come together, we're... We get a lot done. We had an issue with our uh, out with our rink, and within a few months, the city partnered with a bunch of charities and businesses, and we had an outdoor rink available so people could do stuff. The Flames donated the si- the enough boards for for a rink. Um, a paving company gave us like a couple million in free paving. Um, yeah, I were I worked on it myself. I mean, that's another thing we're looking at as a line item and budget now, but it's you know it's really exceptional that as a town, we can come together that way so quickly and draw on so many different people and groups. Like we've got a lot of potential. We talk about potential. We talk about events and I want to go to talking about some events because I'm a massive fan of tourism. I just had the pleasure of visiting Fernie earlier this spring. And I can tell you, it was one of the most welcoming places I've ever stopped in, in my community. It was Mother's Day weekend. It was the Sunday. And there was a lineup down the downtown of people just visiting businesses, sitting out on the open patios and just enjoying themselves. And people didn't know me from Adam were saying hello to me. Very welcoming. There's my little plug for Fernie for two seconds. But <laughs> I like talking about tourism because I like visiting communities. I didn't feel like I got the true experience of what Fernie was. So I want to ask you, as someone who's about to come back to Fernie, what are some of the events? What are some of the tourism hidden gems that you recommend to people if they visit Fernie over the summer? Well, the hidden gems, I'm not going to talk about the hidden gems. Then it wouldn't be hidden. Um, <laughs> You're the first person <laughs> to answer that that way. Thank you so much, Ted. <laughs> hey, you say there's a nice lake. The next the next week, you, you can't park there anymore. It's just full. Um, well, what time of year are you coming? Because that's important. What time of year should I come? <laughs> oh, well, obviously, well, the Derby's running, of course. Uh, no, so, uh, you know, winter sports is obviously really good. We've got a lot of snowmobiling. That's actually become a whole thing. Um, I don't partake cause I'm not wealthy enough to afford to break my bones on a expensive sled that I'm crashing, but the people who can, they love it. Um, skiing is another awesome sport that again, I don't partake, partake in, I can't afford broken bones and I'm bad at skiing, um, laughing, but we do I have apologize. a, we, <laughs> no, 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 no. You can laugh at me. That's fine. I, it's better than people yelling at me. Um, yeah, no. So skiing here is great. Uh, there's some cross country skiing. Um, I was involved in helping out with uh, putting on ski joring uh, this year, which if you don't know, is it's like, and it's funny, I helped set the thing up. I deliberately didn't watch anything or read anything about how ski joring actually happens. I wanted it to be a big surprise for me. Yeah. So they like tow skiers around with horses and the skiers go over jumps and stuff and it's it's pretty cool so we're, we're going to do that again this winter and that's going to be a charity thing that raises money for uh well basically it puts kids in saddles riding horses and you know people who need some mental health time lets them 
do that sort of thing. I think that's actually kind of nice. Um, that was wildly successful as their first step. So winter sports, tons of them, lots. I'm sure I missed something because there's a lot. Uh, there's, you know, our Ghost Rider games are epic. Our rivalry with Kimberly is amazing. I'm told it's not PC, but you'll hear chants of Kimberly's a girl's name and, and you know, some wild things happen at those games. Um, yeah, winter's great. Shoulder seasons, we don't really have a shoulder season anymore. Uh, spring, fall, they're actually the nicest season. Um, in the fall, uh, it's just a beautiful place to be in the fall. That's all there is to it. And that, unless it's raining, in which case, yeah, don't come and, yeah. But, um, spring well, is great. This, and, uh, what about this famous derby? You'd be talking about it. Let's dive into it. 50th anniversary of this derby this year. What is it all about? I just imagine people smashing up cars. <laughs> well, and I'm at risk of crossing some wires here because I'm, a Lions guy and a council guy. So I can't advance business from one while doing the other. And I'll be stepping down as the Lions guy after this year because it just makes things too complicated. But I, I think shilling for the town isn't going to bother anybody. If it bothers somebody, the problem's on them. Um, yeah, so we have a demolition derby that's been running for 50 years. Um minus two for COVID. So it's, it's still our 50th. We just, it would have been a couple of years ago and uh, it's a hundred percent for charity. The Lions club puts this thing on used to be all local boys. Now we, we actually draw from most of Western Canada. Uh, we're one of the better derbies on the circuit. Um, pretty good prizes, legendary small car heat and all for charity. So the Lions club, which when I joined, it was like six people and you know, now it's a really big, successful happening club, and we raise all this money. Since I've been running it, we've turned over well over a million dollars off of this thing and plowed it into everything from hearing aids to transporting, you know, injured people from our hospital to faraway hospitals because they need that. We've we've helped out with uh, – there's a program called Angel Flight, which uh, does that because it's hard to get people over the mountain passes. Um, seeing eye dogs. Um, actually put in the helipad at the hospital. That was a charity deal. Um, tons of things, like tons and tons of things. Like we, when kids win a competition, they need to travel for, you know, sports. We'll, we'll step up for that. Um, basically anything that's local, um, if you're old or really young, and if you're needy, uh, like if you're afflicted or something, you know, if your house burns down, we'll, we'll help you out kind of thing. And every year we more or less zero out the bank account before each derby because we're not a bank and we're there to raise money to help people. And that's, that's what we do. But the crowd at this derby and I, since I, I you know, derbies aren't really my thing. I, I only picked it up because I, I, I started running one. It kind of just landed on my shoulders. I talked to the drivers and they all tell me this is the best derby ever in terms of the crowd. We get the crowd. The crowd is amazing. The backdrop is amazing. There was people just had a, uh, they did their wedding ceremony in our derby grounds because it's just beautiful. Um, and we'll get several thousand cheering people in the stands and they'll do the wave and it's, it's surreal. When you see two cars make a hit and, you know, all the bleachers over there start cheering and all the bleachers over there boo or something, you know, because every driver, they've got their people, right? And they, they all show up. And so... Over 50 years, this has been a major, major driver for a lot of good things in the town, but it's also been a giant party. I mean, it used to be in the 90s, there'd be guys throw a block party while they were wrenching their cars for like a week ahead of this thing, and then they just drive the cars through town to the derby, and that was how that's how it used to be. I mean, we're a lot more professional now, but... Uh, now they yeah. do it for two weeks beforehand, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. That's more, that's more professional. <laughs> Um, I'm going to make you do a little Sophie's Choice here as, as you talk about should we put uh, something over something else as a counselor, but I'm going to make you play a little Sophie's Choice. And where's the spot in your community that you go to to decompress? After a long day of work, after a long council meeting, is there a spot in town? Is there a business? Is there a park? Is there uh, a, an event that you can go to and just let it all go? knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to wake back up, get back at it and try to leave Fernie better off than you got it the day before. Yeah. Um, 
Don't I say like your house, to bicycle. Man. Don't say your house. I, <laughs> because that's no. what every other counselor says to no me. no gosh no there's there's a baby in here and, and a woman and she's pregnant and it's like ah this isn't where we relax anymore um no i uh <laughs> i'll take my baby strap her to my chest and walk around uptown and you know just people will smile because i have a baby i'm used to people going like this because you know i'm but uh you know they see the baby they're happy I bicycle around. That's really nice. But also, and this is, if, if I have a religion, this is it. I float the river. That is, that is my thing. That's what I do. I hop on an inner tube. I drive up to the top of town and I float down and then I bicycle back to get my truck. And that's, that's the only thing really that I will hold to. Like, there's nothing that you're not going to come between me and float in the river when I need to rest. Oh, I want to float the river now. I want to float down. Hey, if you're down here in summer, I'll take you. I'll take you. It's fine. It's great. Let's do it. You got my so number. Before I, before I let you go, I have one last question for you. These were at the 45 minute mark and I try to wrap up at that time. But I got to ask a simple question, but it's a million dollar question because I think it's an important question that I need to hear from. I need to hear the answer from my, the municipal people who come on this show. In your opinion, what makes Fernie such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family. Well, I'd say people, but then backdrop, but then no, the water, and then no, all the cool things that happen here. Like it, there's not, there's not a thing. If if I had to pick a thing, it it would be, it would be people. There's a lot of really awesome people here, really skilled, experienced, intelligent, awesome people who. When push comes to shove, everybody comes together as a community. And that's, I think, pretty rare and special. I haven't, like, really lived too many places, but I suspect this is kind of unique, the degree to which we actually have that overarching sense of community here. Okay. I was I was going to leave on that question, but you got me asking another question. And it's a question that hmm. I, I, I need to ask more often on this show. So hopefully you'll enlighten me with this answer. There are many people who listen to the show. There are many people who watch the show who are thinking about putting their name forward for municipal council. Like yourself, you had to make that decision at the end of the day. But I can imagine you had to balance of what you needed and how you wanted to be. What advice would you give a prospective candidate who's about to put their name on the ballot that you wish you would have known prior to putting your name on the ballot? You get paid. I, I didn't know that when I filled out my thing. Um, I was kind of surprised actually when, really? when I got a check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I I didn't know I got. I, I didn't even. I didn't even. I didn't even care. I didn't know. And well, it's hey, that's nice, I guess. Um, no, uh, you know, there's a poem uh, called "The Man in the Arena," and it's one thing for everybody to sit on the sidelines and snipe at people. But if you really care, and yeah, you might be busy, life might be hard. If you really actually care, rather than snipe about it or gripe about it, jump in with both feet and give it a shot. And if you're right, maybe you do know better and the world will run better because you're trying. And and if you're wrong, well, maybe you'll learn a lot and then you won't grumble and gripe so much. It's, I, I, I would say more people need to jump in even if they're busy even if they've just had a kid um because otherwise the people who do jump in might not be the best people they might have you, you know what if if you feel like your group of people is underrepresented or, or if you're lacking something from government run get your hands on it find out what actually happens find out how the sausage is made it's tough, but then at least you'll never, ever, ever have to what if. And and I always look to that poem, The Man in the Arena, about once you've actually done it, it's it's a world of difference once you've made that plunge and done it. Because then you, you understand a lot more. And I would say having run, I'm probably never really going to go all out double barreled criticizing any other politician ever uh having sat in a seat 
the best way that I think we could end this episode. Uh, Ted, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sitting down with me, taking time out of your busy schedule. I know with a child and new one, uh, one on the way, I can imagine life getting 45 minutes alone is precious. So thank you so much for taking time and sitting with me for 45 minutes and talking about municipalities, uh, Fernie, and of course yourself. It's always a pleasure to meet new interesting municipal leaders. And it's always great to bond over Pokemon Go as we did at FCM. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Drop me a line if you're in town. I'll take you floating, man. Thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our great conversations that we have coming up over the month of July and into Season 7, which launches in September of 2024, literally two months away. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.